tutorials are in colleges. So the way Oxford is, is set up is we've got this sort of distinction between kind of the department and the colleges. Um, in the department, you'd go like with your other 200 first year physicists, you'd go and have the big lectures, the the lecturer, you do also do your labs there. The lecturer will hand out a problem sheet, you know, maybe like 10 questions on a particular topic. The problem sheet you would go through, you'd see doing college, you'd go through in a tutorial, you'd hand it into your tutor, and you and maybe typically one or two of the other first years in your college would go through the questions on the problem sheet um, with your with, with your with with your tutor. So the tutorials are what makes Oxford distinctive. It's the sort of the small the small group teaching um, in college in your tutor's office within inside the um, within the uh, college. Okay, so what I would give you is absolutely in terms of preparing for Pat, absolutely the best advice is to do the Pat past Pat Pat papers because that is the thing that is really specific to Pat. It would you get a sense of kind of what the style of the questions are. Um, what the sort of typical kind of pack question is. I mean, the, so the syllabus is on our website, but the best way to really get a sense of what we mean by the syllabus is to just do the past questions. So start them doing them slowly, you know, spending a lot of time with them, move on to then doing them where you're trying to do the papers to time conditions. So there are also various resources that we'll go through and give you, um, you know, be able to give you solutions or advice on some of the questions. So, and hopefully um, Val will hopefully put some links in the in the chat for this. So there's a YouTube channel, which is being run by the Physics and Materials Outreach Officers, which goes through past PAP papers. There are also some websites, um, you know, they're not, we don't, we're not endorsed or recommended in any way. There's no guarantee that what's there is correct, but I expect you will find them useful, which kind of have got basically work, solution, work solutions for pretty much, you know, many, many years worth of PAP papers. You'll also typically find each year on things like the student room and people who are applying and taking the PAP, the sort of, you know, the community will sort of spontaneously form where people will discuss past questions and, you know, how, how you go about uh, do, doing them. The thing that really determines whether or not you get admitted is how you do in, primarily, how you do in the PAP and how you do in the in in the interviews so you know so if you do well i mean you know so the the current thing is actually that you know the, there's about I, I forget the exact figure but something like 25 percent of the students who apply um, are um sorry who are admitted are in international students and i think i'm su so subject i'm subject to correction on this but i think the in fact the i think the the the, the ratio of international applicants who are admitted is actually is not smaller is not is not smaller. Um, I, th I think it might be marginally larger than the ratio of home students who, who are admitted. Um, so whether you're both international or home, you know, the best way to make a good application is, you know, you know do well in the pack, do well in the interviews, you know, show that you're good at physics and maths, because these are the things which are key for the um, for the course. So in many ways, um, I mean, one of the things I would, you know, in, in some sense, it's, so my experience was, is that physics, one of the things that physics at A-level felt slightly unsatisfactory is there was a lot of the sort of, um, we can't quite explain to you how this works, um, but here are sort of some sort of fudges and some sort of rules you have to remember, you know, and you had to do this ghastly stuff where you do like these left-hand rules and right-hand rules and you sort of go like this and it, you know. Um, the thing about university is you get the kind of you get the real deal. You you get to understand it really properly from what the foundations are and how the you know and how this actually turns into the into the real in, in into the real subject. So um, it will be more mathematical than at A level. I mean, A level physics has this thing that you know if you're a university physics teacher, you know you're always frustrated by the fact that A level physics you know cannot require calculus because calculus is on the math syllabus and it's not on the physics syllabus. So Maths and physics will be far more integrated than they were at school, um, which is good. The subject is kind of more rigorous. You know, you do all the great topics that you've really wanted to learn about. Yeah, the labs are better, the, the, the materials better. You, know, you get to learn stuff properly. I mean, basically, so I think you know, university level physics is just is just better, deeper, more rigorous um, than than school level physics and you get this huge sense of accomplishment when you really understand you know some of these the greatest ideas that people have have, have ever thought you know these sort of real wow moments you only ever really get once when you understand the hydrogen atom which is the base of all of chemistry 
yeah, and you understand the quantum mechanics of how of how atom works. So these are you know, some of the greatest things humans have ever thought or found out. And if you do undergraduate physics, you get to understand them them too. Yeah, so what I would say is that even if you have a mathematics and physics course, um, yeah, there's a certain thing of core physics that you have to do. So for people who are kind of more theoretically minded, what Oxford has, we have what's called the MMath Phys, which people can transfer into the fourth year. And this is like a super theoretical, so it's, a, it's run jointly with the maths department. And it's, and people can come into it either from the, um, doing undergraduate physics or from doing undergraduate maths. And what it basically is, is, you know, a, a super good, advanced, hard, kind of fourth year specialising in the topics of theoretical physics. So people who basically feel, well, maybe what I want to do is sort of a mathematical physics degree or, you know, why isn't there a course in, in both mathematics and physics? Well, basically, you know, there isn't a name for it, but basically there is, um, that in the fourth year, you can choose to do the MMath Phys, which is the essentially, which is a fourth year, which is you know, run jointly by the maths and physics department and gives this kind of really full, deep specialization in topics at the boundary of mathematics and physics. What you do in your first few years, um, you know, you can either follow at Oxford, you can either be coming at this from the maths course, or you can come at it from the physics course. You know, if you're coming at it from the maths course, you will be doing slightly more pure mathematics, you know, analysis, you know, group theory. Um, if you come at it from the physics course, you'll get the experience of doing labs. But for people who are basically who are who are that way inclined, whose interests are really at the boundary of mathematics and physics, yeah, then in the fourth year they should do the um, M math phys. What happens if you miss one? You get thrown off the course. It's never been heard ever that a student has ever like missed a lecture through, for example, you know, going out drinking the night before and oversleeping. <laughs> okay, so um, what happens if you miss a lecture? Um, okay, well, normally you would, you can, you, the way you normally catch up is then you get you get the notes from one of your fellow students. Is the most natural way, you know, one of your fellow students who has attended the lecture. You get the notes, you copy up the notes, and you and you kind of make up. Um, with COVID. It, things are a bit more obviously a lot of the lectures have all been online at the moment and recorded i don't know to what extent that will carry on once everything goes back to um normal but certainly certainly at the moment all the lectures are kind of being rec are recorded and then are available online so at the moment even if a student hasn't watched a lecture as not actually at the time it was kind of originally set they can kind of watch it at whichever time they want to um how frequent lectures i would say my estimate would be that probably two to three hours a day would be the typical amount of lectures in, in the first year of the course. Maybe yeah, two, three hours a day, maybe three hours a day would be the typical thing for the actual lecture times. And then on top of that, you will have uh, labs and labs and tutorials. Okay, so this is a good general question on basically what's the structure of our emissions? Okay, so how do we... Thing. Okay, so Oxford Physics, we would get a lot based on last year, we would we would expect to get about 1,800 applicants um, and we have about 200 places we can offer. So based because we have just you know, a limited capacity to interview, we cannot interview everyone. Um, we don't have the resources to do that. So we interview basically every year we would interview about 500 students. So we interview approximately two and a half students for every place we've got. And the way we shortlist the original something like 1,800 down to um, about 500 is principally through through the PAT. So you sit the PAT, um, then we have your results from the PAT. And so you could look at this. One thing is probably useful for you to hear. If you look at the, our physics web pages, you will find last year's admissions report. So on this, you will find um, you will find a, a little graph which shows you how students have basically you can find this in the report about how um, I, mean, I was just actually see if i could see if i can bring it up bring it up and share it with you so you can see um okay so i'm going to make an attempt to let's see if i can okay so hopefully now you hopefully you can see um this graph this graph here so if you can see this, this then what you will see. So this is the basically the PAT scores last year, 
And basically the blue is everyone. The orange are people who got invited to interview and the black is people who got a place. So using primarily the PAT score, but also all details about candidates application, because so you will see that, for example, you know, that, that everyone above a score of about 67 got invited for interview, but then also some people with scores much lower than that got invited to interview. So we use all the information, we use the contextual information. This is where things like widening participation questions come in. You know, we look at people's schools, their backgrounds, whether they're doing single maths or double maths. All these questions are coming in to basically what, whether someone should be um, shortlisted given their PAT score. Then what will happen is in December, there will be people are invited to interview. So they have three interviews. All interviews are online this year, you know, as last year, this is a decision from the Central University, all interviews for all subjects will be online. So what they would be is that they would be kind of like this, um, except I would be seeing you rather than you just seeing me. Most likely you would have some kind of virtual whiteboard, I would write on it, the question, a question would appear, you know, you would write on it, I would then ask you, well, what, what do you think about that term? Are you sure that term's correct? You know, have you thought about uh, the effect, the effects of gravity here? Yeah, you know, these, these sorts of questions to kind of prompt you to kind of then see how you respond into the interview and then you have so you have three interviews two interviews with your kind of quote unquote first choice college and one interview with your quote unquote second choice college and each of these interviews gets a mark it, it gets a mark out of 10 and then we combine the interview scores and your PAT scores and in previous years information about your um your contextual GCSE results to produce an overall numerical score, which we use to rank candidates. The ranking is not binding, but it's there as a guide. And based on that, we then decide um, who we are going to going to offer the places to. OK, so I'm going to so that um, you can find this this graph. This is part of the last year's uh, physics physics emissions report. Um, and you can find it on our on our on our physics department web page with more detail about the process the exact process from last year there's two things i want to pull out from this question first of all we recommend strongly everyone applies for the mphys I, I don't even know whether you can apply for the ba anymore but you should apply for the mphys in any case and the reason for this is it's easy to transfer from the mphys to the ba to the for four year course to the three year course you just leave a year earlier and you finish a year earlier that's easy to do whereas going the other way might be might be might be kind of harder in terms of um questions of fine of of finances but yes there is a standard offer that everyone gets and so if you're in a uk system or a system which offers a levels then that standard offer will be a star aa so you have to get the so the, these three subjects have to include both physics and maths and the a star has to be in either physics, maths, or further maths. You also need, if you're using any any science subjects you're using to make your offer, you also need to pass the practical requirement. And this is the standard offer that everyone basically will get. Um, in principle, it could be possible for something to deviate from the standard offer, but it would require a truly exceptional set of circumstances for for someone kind of not to receive the. The, 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 the standard offer and by truly exceptional I mean the sort of thing that would typically happen to no candidates to zero candidates in a typical um, admissions year. Students who are from you know who are not doing A-levels who are doing IB who are doing uh, Scottish hires or who are doing kind of one of the many kind of other international qualifications the university's got um, a very useful page which shows what our standard offers translate to in all of these other systems for pretty much any exam system around the world. So Val, this is something if we can put that in the chat, um, then if we can put the, in the kind of the link to the international requirements and basically how the standard offer translates to the different international requirements, I think people would probably find that useful. I should also say about the standard offer. You know, it's a deliberate policy of the physics department here. Our standard offer, our offer level is not meant to be the most demanding part of our application. You know, most students who come to us who arrive at Oxford have, will have straight A stars. They will not have just got the standard A star AA offer. Yeah, you know, by policy and by choice, um, the, the, the most demanding parts of our admissions process are the PAT test, which is a hard test where the average mark is about 50 percent and our and our interviews. The achieving the standard offer is not meant to be the most demanding part of the process for um, for UK 
shooters for people or people doing the doing handguns.